but we're going to have you come and to share what God has done. Sister Mary Lou spoke yesterday at the uh, the fellowship breakfast, and you, if you're not making it out to that, you should come. We have a great time in Mount uh, Brookfield the third the third week, and uh, you should come on out and enjoy it. Uh, God, she was going through all of the miracles God has done in her family's life since she came to know the Lord. And so let's give, we said, let's have her talk about this at church. So let's uh, give Mary Lou and God a great big welcome. Amen. So they finally caught up with him 
and he had to come and get us. And that was the beginning of a nightmare, but we'll just leave that and go over to where I'll pick it up about getting saved. I heard from my aunts and uncles that my mother was a praying mom, so those prayers were already at work with God, because God had a lady over here at the school that was a Christian woman by the name of Dee Morrell, and she kept asking me to go to church with her. I kept making up excuses till I couldn't think of any more lies to tell her. So I finally told her that I would go with her just to get her off my back. Now, when I was in the Catholic Orphanage, we were taught by the nuns that we should respect anybody that had gray hair, and this lady had gray hair. So I really respected her even though I didn't want to go to church with her. All right, no. But she went to this Nazarene church in North Sacramento, and she never gave up on me, though. She kept asking me to go to church with her. And um, so when I did go to the church, you talk about sneaky, she had everybody in there waiting for me to come and praying. <laughs> so, when I walked through them doors, the power of God was so strong, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about God or the power of God or nothing, but I knew that I never felt like that before. And so one minute I was sitting in my seat, and the next minute I was running down the aisle, because I was so hungry for something. I needed something. And it was God. But you have to realize that I didn't have a mom, and I didn't have this, and I didn't have that. No aunts, no uncles, none of that stuff. And I just was, I guess I was mad at God. I didn't believe him, but I guess if he was there, I was still mad at him because I thought life was very unfair. Other people, I watched them and I seen the kids climb up on the laps of their parents and their hugs and kisses they got and I didn't get none of that. So, and that was 51 years ago. Me getting saved was the first miracle. Miracle number two happened like this. Shortly after I turned my life over to Jesus, I found out that my 15 year old daughter was expecting. Was I in shock? She was supposed to be babysitting just kids. I didn't let her date. She was too young. But she wasn't babysitting children. She was babysitting a boyfriend. So, I, you know, I wasn't a smart mother then. I didn't, didn't know how to check up on your kids and um, make sure they're where they say they're supposed to be and all that good stuff. So, anyway, one night we were taking the family to a Christian function. And I had been praying and praying for Gloria to get saved, but to no avail. We were all at the Governor's Hall. Anybody remember the Governor's Hall downtown? Okay. And um, Gloria was up in the bleachers singing in the choir, the Nazarene choir. She was up there. And I was down on the floor in the auditorium. And when they gave the altar call, I was so tired and discouraged that I just hung my head and I told the Lord, I'm done. I am done. I'm done. I'm not praying for that girl no more. But as I stood there with my head down, my friend Jan, who stood next to me, touched my arm and said, Sis, look at Gloria. At first I didn't look up, and when I did, I was in total shock. Gloria was coming down from way up in the bleachers, stepping on people, stepping on their heads and their laps all over, coming down. She was coming to the altar. And I just stood there and cried like a baby. So see, when you take your hands off of things, then Jesus can come in and do the work. And she got saved that night. And she's been serving God ever since. And you all remember, she comes here and sings lots of times. Okay, uh, that was um, in 1966, and in 1968, this is miracle number three, Jan and I went to church faithfully with our eight children. Can you imagine coming to the church with eight kids? But then we were young in the Lord, and we didn't know how to deal with some things in the church, so we got our feelings hurt, and 
That's what the enemy uses because the church is full of people, just people. I mean, and we're not saints, we're just trying to be saints. And we're still just people with different kinds of attitudes. And the main thing is don't, don't wear your feelings on your sleeve. Come to church for God, not for people. And, and don't take offense. And, um, so we got our feelings hurt and put going. By this time, my daughter had a little boy by the name of Ronnie. He's my son's namesake. By now, I had met a man that had loved me and was very good to my five kids, so we got married. And one day, I was watching my grandson, Ronnie, at my house when I noticed him behind the door in the bedroom, and he was choking on a piece of plastic from a model car that the, bo the older boys had been uh, putting together. He was turning blue when I found him and almost unconscious because his air had been cut off. And I didn't know for how long, and I didn't know what to do. And someone called 911. And I wondered if they would get there in time to save him. My oldest son, Ronnie, one sleeping in the chair back there. <laughs> My oldest son, Ronnie, um, his uncle, took him from my arms, and by this time he was limp. My son had enough composure to run his middle finger down the baby's throat to dislodge a piece of plastic so it could pass on down into his stomach and didn't uh, cause any complications. Praise the Lord. He was saved and everything was fine. So that was the beginning of many miracles. In 1969, Miracle 4, after James and I was married, we decided to look and to, to look for a farm since we both loved horses and we needed um, and we needed a bigger place. And James had joined a wagon train that he went on once a year, and so he ended up buying some more horses. Well, we weren't in church, but God was still working in my life with his goodness and his mercy. Uh, I want to stop here and say that even when you're backslid, God doesn't give up on us. We might give up on him. We might walk away from him. But he goes right along with us. And he's pulling our chestnuts out of the fire as we're making our mistakes. Yes, he wants us to come back and redo our work over again with him. But he does not leave us. The enemy would like us to believe that he leaves us. But he doesn't. And... Um, we weren't in church. God was still working in my life, though. Picture this. We had cows that we milked, rabbits, dogs, uh, cats, kids. James had two, and I had five, plus my little grandson. He was about two then and was into everything. Our house was full. Even my brother David came to live with us, and he had to pitch a tent out in the yard and live in it. We had five acres, though, and we had lots of room. But he was a horse lover, too, and so it was like... Um, from the Ozarks, you should have seen us with our broken down truck and the kids and the cats and the dogs and the cows. And Jan was out there milking the cow in the mornings and I was churning the milk to make butter and we, we was having a good time. Except I wasn't there in church serving the Lord. One day I was standing on the balcony of our old farmhouse watching from afar as my husband and some other men were out in the pasture breaking a horse to ride. By now, baby Ronnie was walking, and he was into everything. Um, I was looking out there when I seen the baby walking toward the horse, and all I could do was yell, as I realized that no one was paying any attention to the baby, and it was, their attention was focused on the horse. And just then, the baby decided to sit down right underneath the horse. And here, the men are sandbagging the horse, trying to get the horse used to the weight on his back because people wanted to ride him. And the little baby sitting underneath the horse on the cement, just like, you know, he had good sense. Now, that is not the safest place to sit. It happened so fast as I stood there and watched, knowing something terrible was going to happen, and I couldn't do anything. I was up in the balcony. I don't remember calling on Jesus, but I know I did. Because just as the horse picked up his feet to kick, someone, I don't remember who, ran over, grabbed the baby out from underneath the horse's feet. And it all happened so fast 
that I knew once again that Jesus had come to the rescue. God had saved my precious little loved one from being trampled, hurt, even killed. Through the years, I've seen the hand of God bringing life into my family where there should have been death. What, what an awful, awesome God we serve. I know there's probably a lot of people out here in the audience that have miracles too, and I think that we should share them. I mean, because how else is people going to know about the wonderful work that God has done in Kengu? I mean, when you talk to some people about praying, they just look at you like, yeah, okay. When that should be the most important thing, you know? In Hebrews, he says that he will never leave us and forsake us, and that is true. In 1972, this is Miracle 5, my daughter Gloria's second baby was born. It was a boy, and we called him Richard. He was premature by six weeks. My daughter was sick at the time, the whole nine months that she carried him, and so instead of gaining weight, she lost weight. When he was born, he weighed two pounds, six ounces, and then dropped down to two pounds, two ounces. You could hold him in the palm of your hand. Of course, the doctors didn't give us much hope for him even though he had survived and was alive. His little lungs were not fully formed, and therefore he had to be hooked up to machines to breathe for him. And every time he wet his little diaper, his heart would stop, and the alarms would go on. The ICU nurse then would go into his room and flick the bottom of his feet and start him breathing again. He was born feet first, and he was a sight. Before she delivered him, one of the doctors came and told her that the baby was dead. But she knew better because she had felt him moving. And they were very surprised when he came out and he was alive. But they didn't give us much hope, even though he was alive, that he would survive. But my daughter kept believing that God would pull him through. And God did. The doctor said that even if he did live, he wouldn't be normal because of his oxygen being cut off. They said that he would have disabilities like retardation, deafness, and being blind. Don't you just love it when God shows up after all hope is gone and everything comes out normal? I just love it. I just love it. I just want to run the halls over there at UC Davis when they told me Richard was going to die. And I knew when my pastor went in there and anointed him. He was going to make it. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. He's going to make it. No. Um, Richard, uh, let's see. Okay. Richard gained weight, and when he reached five pounds, he came out of the hospital. He was two months old by then, and he was on high risk. During that time of Richard's birth, my daughter Gloria needed a blood transfusion. And at that time, they didn't check the blood. And she ended up with chronic hepatitis C. That's another story. So... Can you see why I want to get up and praise the Lord? This is just a drop in the bucket of what he has done. Uh, I can remember miracles I haven't put down here, but I said I can't take all that time because he's just a miracle working God. And I want to get up on the highest building in town and just say we serve a miracle working God. In 1972, miracle number seven, by the time James and I, by that time James and I had bought an old two-story house, farmhouse that we called our own, and it was here in the Heights on Maury Avenue, and that's where I live to this day. I have been there 44 years. I didn't want to live there, and I kept coming up with reasons why we should we could move. But every time we moved, we'd have to move back. After I lost my husband to cancer, I thought, surely God will let me move now. And I was on my way to Montana. Wrong. When God has a plan for you, you don't change it. It changes you. Yes. If, if people would just give in in the beginning, they'd save a lot of wear and tear and yes. shoot leather on themselves trying to do their thing in the name of the Lord when God's already got your plan worked out for you. Now keep in mind that I'm still backslidden. I was away from the Lord for nine years, and this day I was up on a ladder fixing a hole in the side of the farmhouse that the woodpeckers had made. 
and I wasn't in the best of moods. I was complaining to myself about everything. I was using a few choice words when I felt the ladder slip and start to fall. I believe God shoved it over. I really do. <laughs> Mood. So as I was falling the 10 feet in the air, I knew I was in trouble. So what else could I do except call on Jesus? As I was falling, I was calling, God help me. And crash, I hit the pavement, cut gravel on the side of my face, and ended up with three cracked vertebrae. It could have been worse, so I could have broken my neck or my back, but I didn't. God had cushioned my fall. Thank you, Lord. And that is where my journey back to the Lord begins. And he was waiting there with open arms. Just like the prodigal son, I knew that I had gone as far as I could go doing my thing. I had had two close calls and I didn't need a third one to show me that I needed to get back making things right between me and my Lord. So as I lay there in my bed for three weeks, I made up my mind that if God would give me another chance, I would try to do things right this time. All right, now. Miracle number eight, the year is 1987. Well, by now I'm back in church and I'm teaching Bible study and Sunday school right here at Victory. And life is pretty good. My first great grandson, Buddy, was born that year. And he's about two years old. And he was out in the yard playing with his papa, James, helping him. James was letting him ride in the back of the truck with him as he hooked up his flatbed trailer and put his wagon on it that he used in the wagon trains. Um, James got everything ready and put Buddy off to the side of the truck and told him, stay there. As James pulled out, Buddy ran toward the truck. James didn't see him, and at that time, because he was running between the truck and the trailer, James looked in his rearview mirror and he felt, thought that Buddy had fallen off the trailer. But he hadn't. Uh, the trailer had run over Buddy and flipped him up in the air, but James didn't realize that. He stopped the truck, got out, picked the baby up, and took him into his parents and told him what he thought had happened. But my grandson Ronnie and his wife realized the baby was very seriously hurt and took him to Kaiser. There they stabilized him and as well as they could and transported him to UC Davis because they didn't have a trauma center there at Kaiser. He was quickly evaluated and we were told that he had a bruise on his brain, a punctured lung, and a, lac a lacerated spleen, which caused a bleeding ulcer. They had to give him numerous transfusions, but he continued to bleed. So they informed the family that they were going to operate in an attempt to stop the bleeding. They finally took him into surgery and everybody was praying. That's all we could do at that time. We were out to UC Davis, was trying to find a chapel to go in to pray, and they didn't have one. And I told someone there, that's the main thing that you should have. You should have some place where people, when they bring injured family members in here, can go and pray, because it's a necessity, I think, really. So we had to go find a closet and close the door and pray in the closet. We were told that the sur surgery would take several hours, but it only took 30 minutes. And when the doctors came out, they said that the bleeding ulcer had healed itself. That was due to prayer, right? Um, within two weeks, he was out of the hospital and doing well, although he was very weak and quiet. He was doing fine. That was just the Lord because um, there was many things that happened. Well, one thing that the Lord had me do, my buddy was in, in his room. He was tied up to machines, and he he had blood coming out of areas on, on him. And the Lord told me, he spoke to me, and he said, take the anointing cloth, cloth, cloth that you have in your pocket and stand here by his bedside and rub it over his body. And I thought, I don't have an anointing cloth in my pocket. And I put my hand into my pocket, and I did. Amen. I had gotten it for somebody else and forgot to give it to him. 
And so I stood there all night long rubbing that all over my grandson. He doesn't remember to this day. I asked him, he's 20 some odd years old right now. And I said, do you remember grandma standing by you, praying over you and when he was hurt and rubbing you with the anointing cloth? He said, no grandma, I don't remember anything about that part of my life. So uh, anyway, um, year 2005, Miracle 9, my youngest son, Mark, had a major stroke on Mother's Day. And the doctor said that it should have killed him. But he was always working out and boxing. And he had built up extra veins in his body, because he built good, in his, uh, here in his neck, OK? And so when the stroke came, the blood that should have went through the arteries that wasn't working anymore went over to the new arteries. All right. And he was fine. I, I got to the hospital and I said, where's my son? I expected to see him near death. He's sitting up in bed with his arms folded. These doctors don't know what they're talking about. There ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm going home. He was a little confused, but he was fine. And the doctor walked in and said, where's the stroke patient? And I said, right there. And he goes, you're a stroke patient? And he said, that's what they tell me. So it was just the Lord. New arteries. And I had the same thing with me. When I go to see my heart doctor, this is all plugged up. I've got new arteries growing in the back of my head. He doesn't know how come I do, but I'm fine other than I get confused every now and then. <laughs> you know, uh, God is such a miracle working God. You know? yeah. Okay, year of 2008, Miracle 10, I had a heart attack. I just told about that. And there's no, my heart is not damaged at all. I'm just uh, short of air and I have to take medicine all the time. Year 2009, Miracle, Miracle 11. I had mentioned earlier in my testimony that in that year of 1972, my daughter Gloria had had a blood transfusion where she caught chronic hepatitis. Well now it is 2009 and the damage to her liver is showing up. And at this time she is told that she was in liver failure due to the virus and also had cirrhosis of the liver. Usually you get that from drinking. Yeah. Well, she did that too, but I mean, you know, one or the other messed her liver up. The doctors put her on, I can't pronounce it, two different medicines which caused her to be sicker than what she was. And at that time she was given another blood transfusion and more shots to make her white cells come back up to where they belong. They kept her on treatment for a month and then took her off again, then put her back on for three months, and then the doctor said that it was making her condition worse and to stop it. The treatment was stopped, and the doctors told her that she had three months to five years to live. Now we're going to fast forward to June of 2015. They had come out with a new drug that had been in the testing stages when Gloria was taking her other meds. And she was told it was very successful, but she wasn't elder before. Despite what the doctor said, though, they got Gloria on, she got on the new drug, but because of due to a persistent PCA, Gloria was able to get on the new drug for six months. Even if she didn't have the $1,000 a day, mm. she got the medicine. How? I don't know other than God. She shouldn't have been able to get it. She shouldn't have been eligible for it, okay? And that, um, let's see, God provides all, God has always provided all of our needs. He'll provide all of our needs if we just will turn everything over to him and trust him, okay? In January 2016, the tests show now that Gloria no more has the virus hep C. So we need to praise the Lord for that. She came here last year to sing and uh, Pastor Tim and Pastor Johnny both prayed over her and they each gave her a word and the word turned out to be absolutely correct that God was going to heal her and I um, can't say she's doing fine but she's doing much better than she did but she will always have that damage she only has 20 per part 20 part 20 per part of her, of her uh, liver left but it's just like having a whole liver to some people. I mean, you know, 
Like I keep telling her, Lori said, Mom, I don't have much longer to live. I said, oh, yes, you do. You're not checking out until God wants you to check out. So you know, don't get in a hurry. Okay, 2011, Miracle 12. My grandson, Richard, Gloria's son, the preemie baby from 1972, is now 39 years old. And he's working at a property management place where the job is very stressful. <laughs> He had a lot of responsibilities on his job, and one day at work, he started to have chest pains and had to have his secretary drive him to the hospital. Right after he arrived, while in one of the small examining rooms, he fell off the table and he died. It was documented that he flatlined and was dead for 35 minutes. But the doctor that was working on, on him wouldn't give up, and he kept using the paddles on him over and over and over way past the legal time to give up. Later on, we looked at Richard's chest and he had the hair burned off and one of his nipples was burned off. While they went, well, they finally got a pulse and they brought him back, but the doctors came and found me and told me that he was barely alive and they didn't hold out much hope for him. I told him that I believed in prayer and he was going to make it. Two days later, he woke up from his coma and he knew everybody in the hospital room. The doctors were very surprised. They said that if he did survive, he would be like a vegetable because of lack of oxygen. He couldn't talk because of all the tubes plus being incubated to him. So, plus being incubated to help him breathe. But he could communicate with his eyes and he could write notes. His first year was pretty bad. His kidneys were, weren't working properly and, they had, to, and he had, they had to put a catheter on him, which he wore for a year. In fact, he had to have two. Uh, one in his bladder and the other one you can just imagine where. He had to go to dialysis regularly for the first year. And after that, he had to have surgery to remove the catheters because they had built up scar tissue and it was really, really bad. No, we had talked to Richard's doctor previously and asked him why he kept using the paddles on him so long and he couldn't really answer our question. All he could say was he just had to keep doing it. Wow. So it was just gone. Yes. Yes. God has the right people at the right time doing what God wants them to do. Yeah. And sometimes they don't even understand it. I myself have said things and done things that I go, where did that come from? Right. It's just the Lord. He will put the words in your mouth. He'll tell you when to stop. He'll tell you when to go. Yeah. Okay, Miracle 13, year 2017. This is about my great grandson that just got in a car wreck over here on the freeway. The day started off like any other day when my phone rang with bad news. My great-grandson, Damien Hobbs, was involved in a serious accident on Highway 80. The car that he was riding in was hit in a chain reaction. He was in the last car in a seven-pile car, seven-pile car, uh, whatever. He was not wearing a seat belt and he was thrown out of the car. The driver of the car had his seat belt on and only received a broken shoulder. The car that Damien was in rolled several times. He was, he's a very small framed boy, and he doesn't look like he could weigh 100 pounds soaking wet. He was thrown several feet in the air, striking the cement retainer wall that runs along the side of the freeway. By the time the ambulance got there, he was in critical condition. His small body was broken in many pieces. The doctors at UCD work to put him back together, feeling that it was of no use since they brought him in. He thought they were going and he, they looked at him, they thought he was going to die from all of his injuries. He had broken bones in his back, broken ribs, a broken collarbone, a fractured skull, and his face, and his face was hurt. His brain was so swollen that the doctors had to remove the top part of his skull so that his brain could finish swelling. You should have seen him. He looked like he had a he had a hat on to keep his brain intact because the top of his skull was gone and he looked like he had a football helmet on. I don't know what kind of uh, helmet it was that they put on. I guess it's 
made especially for people that had, had head injuries. But, um, and he was fighting the doctors all the way. They had to tie him down and put a tent over his bed. And he wasn't going to get out of there and go home. And he couldn't. He would have died. And uh, he just was, wasn't acting good at all. No. Um, okay. His brain was swollen, and they had to take the top part off. And they were thinking that they could make him, they was thinking they was going to have to make him titanium eye sockets because they even thought he was going to be blind because it injured, it injured all up on top of his forehead and everything. When his grandfather, my, my son Ronnie, got the news, he asked me, Mom, would you take me to see him? Now, I don't drive on the freeway. I don't really drive at all. I keep my license up. I didn't want to, but the Lord put his thumb in my back and I had to renew it. But I go here and I go to the store. You very seldom ever see me out on the street. So, And when Ronnie said, Mom, would you take me to the hospital? I'm going, oh, Lord, how am I going to get to UC Davis? You know? <coughs> I reminded him I couldn't take the freeway and we would have to go down 12th Street. And you know, you go down 12th Street, then you go over to Alhambra, then you go down Stockton Boulevard, and that, that, that. So we went all the way through town, and when we finally got there to the hospital, everybody was there waiting to hear how Damien was. I couldn't go in and see him and anoint him with oil, so I just prayed right there in the parking lot of the hospital. I was there trying to comfort my family, and I hurt for my grandson, but I had a peace about me that it can only come from knowing Jesus and know that he was in good hands. Okay. All the doctor, all and as all the doctors worked on him, not knowing he was going to make it, the Lord had already told me he would live and not die, but that it would be a long road back. Well, Damien is out of the hospital now and he's on his way to mending, oh. all because we serve an awesome God. Yes. We never This is the last miracle. It's not the last one that's been in my family, but it's the last one I'm going to tell you about. Uh, they had the, you know when they had the big fire up here in Orville? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I have a son that lives up there. I'll finish this with, in July, news broke out that there was a large fire in the foothills of Orville. My middle son has a home up there at, off of Black Bark Road. And right where the fire was, the fire was right behind him. As the fire grew closer, people in the path of the fire was evacuated, leaving everything behind. Even in some cases, their medications they had to leave behind. My son has had a stroke, and he's had several heart attacks, and he has Crohn's disease and some other things that's wrong with him. And he needed his meds, but he had to leave them behind and just go out, get his little son, put it in the truck, and leave. As the fire got closer and closer, all we could do was pray. We prayed for everyone on that hill. The fire did not touch some, and their things were set, were not lost, but then, but then some of them lost everything. Why? I can't say. But my son's home was saved and not touched at all, while his two friends, one on either side of him, lost everything. Go right. figure, prayer works. There are so many miracles at work in our lives today, but sometimes we don't stop and see God's hand at work. Amen. So, anyway, I just wanted to share this, not for me, but for the Lord. I get got upset. I got so upset when Richard was in the hospital, and they didn't put it on in the newspaper. I, I something like that. I think should be on the front page. Amen. Amen. God's moving. He's not dead. Look yes. what he's doing. Yes. My grandson Damien walked out of the hospital when they thought he was not going to survive. He should have been in there. God should be getting more glory than what he's getting. And that's why I felt that I needed to put down all the miracles that he's done just in my family. And I know there's a lot of people out there that has way more miracles than I do. Here? 